All right, thank you for being patient. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about establishing a data-driven culture. Um, it has a lot of parallels with, with what Catherine was uh, just uh, saying. And um, as data scientists, we all know the value of data. It's just something that's obvious to us. That's what we work on. Um, we love the insights that we can get from data. Um, we love how it can radically transform decision making at times. And, and we love how the courses of action that might be taken can be completely changed. And, and all of that's great. But what I've found is that while this is obvious to us as data scientists, it might not be obvious uh, to other people. And um, as a data scientist, I feel like it's extremely important, while it's extremely important to generate the insights and generate um, excitement about different aspects of what we are working on, it's equally important to make sure that our teams are aligned and, um, and we are making data-driven decisions. Because even if somebody says that they're data-driven, when push comes to shove, just like Catherine said, oftentimes you revert right back to instinct. And so as a data scientist, how can you not only generate the insight, but get everybody on board with a data-driven decision-making process? That's, that's basically in a nutshell what I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so a little bit of background. I work um, in something called a probe card company. I'm going to keep the background short for two reasons, because one, a lot of it's not relevant to this audience, and two, a lot of it's proprietary. Um, so I work in something called probe cards, and probe cards are devices that are used to test um, semiconductor chips. And um, there are many different kinds of probe cards, but the ones that I work on are really basically the most complex. But if you look at the um, top left, you see these tiny microsprings. Imagine thousands of these tiny microsprings, um, tens of thousands actually, uh, of these tiny microsprings. That's basically the research and development of that is what I work on. And just to give you an idea of the scale involved, each of those springs is about less than a hair width, and the spacing between two of those is about half a hair width. So this is a pretty um, small system, and as a result, there are a lot of complexities that come up. All right, so as you can imagine, like I said, this is an extremely complex system, many interacting variables, many um, physical variables, thermal, electrical, mechanical materials. So as a result, there are a large number of, um, of variables, um, sometimes numbering in the hundreds that you have to deal with. Um, and of course, there's domain knowledge and there's designed experiments that you, that you can use to pare down uh, the number of variables, but it's still a pretty challenging system nonetheless. All right, so the way I'm gonna do this talk um, is I've, I'm going to talk about a recent product development effort that I was involved in. And as we go through that, I'm going to talk about the different insights I had at different points in time. And hopefully that will be of value um, to people in this audience. So my team was involved in uh, developing a new product, uh, very similar to what I was describing, but a, a new architecture. And everything was going great, but about, we had this occasional defect crop up about 8% of the time. And in my industry, 8% is, is, is high enough that it's gonna cause a problem, and it's something that you have to worry about. But it's low enough, especially with the equipment limitations and the scale that we had to deal with, that it was not easy to understand what's going on through direct observation. So. Uh, that that kind of sets the stage on, on, on the kind of uh, challenges that we are dealing with in this problem. So who are the characters in the story? The characters are um, my team, which basically consists of a few managers um, 
and a few engineers, um, basically domain experts. And there was one data scientist who was also a domain expert. That happened to be me. And so different people like to solve problems different ways. Uh, given I'm, I'm a data scientist as well, I prefer data-driven approaches to uh, solving problems. Um, and you know, that's as as we go through this, you'll see there there'll be a little bit of a tussle um, in that. So we have this defect, and what do we do now? The typical approach in with a problem like this in my industry is to do something called a postmortem analysis, where you take the defective part and you analyze it and you observe it and try to glean at as many clues as you can. Unfortunately, given a lot of the challenges involved that I, some of which I described, the scale, the uh, equipment limitations, this didn't really yield much in terms of results. So we had to go a different route. So being a data scientist, you can well imagine what I would have proposed. Um, I just wanted to collect as much relevant data as I, can, as I could and just go and look for insight. Now, this, in this slide in a nutshell is the life of a data scientist. You try and look at, your, look at your existing data and see if you can generate the insight that's needed. Then you realize, well, I guess I, I really need more pertinent data to solve this problem. You go back, but there's oftentimes a lot of pushback on getting the data that you need. And there's, there's a number of legitimate reasons for that. You know. Oftentimes, it's, it's not easy to get the data that's needed. It's not a trivial exercise. A lot of resources may be needed. Um, other times, people might, not just, might just not believe in your approach. Either way, um, it's something that a data scientist has to deal with on a regular basis. And um, you know, my approach is, as a data scientist, it's not only my job to get the insight, but also get people on board with the approach that I'm proposing. So if I want more data, can I actually get everybody on board with that? Or maybe I can just go do it myself if it's a small enough problem um, and I'm willing to spend the time. In this case, actually, that's exactly what I did. It's, um, I went and just collected the data myself. Um, there's, there was a pain, it was painstaking effort of about a few hundred hours over um, a few weeks. But at, you know, I, I had to make manual measurements using a microscope, so that, that took a while. Um, I had some eye strain, whatever. You, know, you, can, you can live with that if you can get the results. Um, and so at the end of it all, I had a bunch of data on this problem that I felt would help me generate the root cause for this, um, for this uh, defect that we are actually seeing. So, all right, data scientist, you have data, what, what do you want to do now? All right, you know what data scientists do, they just, we're all about just going and looking for, um, um, exploring the data, looking for insight, mining for correlations, that's, uh, you know, pretty much similar things. That's, that's what I did, exploratory analysis. Uh, ran a few models, um, random forest, generalized linear models. And I, I could discern some patterns in the data that I thought, given I also have domain expertise, made sense. Uh, but the interesting thing to note here is that even though it made sense, uh, in hindsight, if you'd asked me, hey, do you, can you come up with this reason before having collected the data? I would have said no, because it involved extremely unintuitive interactions between the variables. So that's, that's one of the things that's, that's great about data science and machine learning and um, all these approaches is the fact that it can lead you down paths that you might never imagine yourself. And this is given, I've, I've been, uh, collectively, we, we all must have had about 20, 25 years of experience um, on, on this kind of product. And it was un unintuitive for every single one of us. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big win in my, my opinion that, you know, it can point you out to things that you would have never expected. All right, so 
we've, I had some, uh, a few hypotheses that I thought could be the reason for this defect. But in, in this kind of industry, it's really important to establish causation. Um, in the big data world these days, it seems like everybody's all about correlation, causal inference is almost relegated to the side in some ways. Uh, but causation is the name of the game uh, in this kind of setting. So uh, what I did was designed a few experiments to validate and see which of these hypotheses was actually um, the root cause. And it turned out that one of them was in fact the root cause, Great, you know, I would have been sorely disappointed if none of them had panned out, but one of them wa was in fact the root cause, so that was great. So what do you do at this point? Great, you've, you've, uh, you've identified the root cause, you know, life's great. Of course you celebrate, that's, that's what you do, but just as importantly, um, you do something else. And that's evangelize. Uh, just as a side note, I, the defect rate went down from 8% to 0.1% after, um, after this. So that was, that was great. So like I said, this is, you know, you celebrate, but you also, this is the best time to evangelize and explain to people what you actually did uh, and get them on board. The main reason for that is everybody's much more relaxed. Nobody's under any pressure. Uh, people are going to be receptive, and you just showed them that what you were proposing worked. So what's a better time than that to explain to people, you know, this is, this is, how, uh, this is how I did this, this is what um, worked, and this is why. And this is how we can actually apply it to other problems in our business. And that's what I did. I went out and explained to people what I did and why I did it and how we can ap apply it to different domains in our, in our business. And that's great. That was, that was great. People were really excited about it. But what I found is excitement doesn't mean that long-term change happens. So from excitement, from the excitement that you generate, you have to somehow weave, um, weave that kind of um, new culture into the fabric of the team. And, and the thing that I did for that, um, in this case that really helped, was I came up with a custom platform um, and that basically collected about 50 different kinds of data and presented in one unified view for anybody to access, and they could they could analyze and come up with their own insights, and that kind of wove that that habit and that culture into the team. So that's basically my talk. The key takeaways are establishing a data-driven culture's work, and one strategy that I used was to execute successfully on a project, evangelize, and empower.